Hello, how's it going? Uh, I thought I'd come out here tonight. It's a nice night out here and uh, shoot you another video, talk a little about some water chemistry. Now this may feel like a little bit of a digression, like wh wh where does this fit in and why are we talking about this now? But I think, I think when we get through the next couple lectures, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, specifically, our next lecture is going to be on osmosis, uh, which is the diffusion of water. And so understanding the properties of water will help us with that. Um, but in general, understanding water chemistry, the properties of water, is going to be useful the rest of the semester. So that's kind of why we want to talk about this in here. And, um, and it's an important component of chemistry. It explains many phenomena in biology. Uh, again, it's biology class. Why are we talking so much about chemistry? Because chemistry is everything. And to understand biology, you need to understand some chemistry. So let's talk about water a little bit. And so, of course, you know water's H2O. But if you study or if you look at the, the shape of the molecule, it's got a, a very unique shape. You've got that oxygen and you've got two hydrogens attached to it, but they're not straight across from each other. They're kind of in, a, in a, an angle. And that angle is about 104, 105 degrees. And um, so essentially, in every water molecule, you sort of have one end of the molecule that's oxygen and one end that's hydrogen. And that actually um, provides a very important property of water in that it is it has polarity or it is a polar molecule. And so what do we mean by that? Um, a polar molecule has separate charges. So it has a positive end and a negative end. A nonpolar molecule doesn't. A nonpolar molecule has no area that has a, a particular um, charge to it. Now, you know, all atoms, molecules, for the most part, are neutral. The overall molecule is neutral. So the, o the water, the overall charge on the water is neutral. It doesn't have a, a net charge. It's not an ion. But within the molecule, you've got a more positive area and a more negative area. And that is a polar molecule. And water is a polar molecule. And so you remember that you know, when we have a covalent bond and those hydrogens bond to that oxygen, they're sharing an electron, right? And so that electron orbits the hydrogen, then it orbits the oxygen, then it orbits the hydrogen, then it orbits the oxygen, and in that way it, it binds those atoms together. But in water, that electron spends more time around the oxygen than it does around the hydrogens. And so it sort of goes around the hydrogen, then it goes around the oxygen a bunch, then it goes around the hydrogen, then it goes around the oxygen a bunch. So you're sharing that electron, but you're sharing it unequally. And since electrons have a negative charge, that means the, the side of the water molecule that has the oxygen is going to be more negative because those electrons tend to cluster near that oxygen. And then the hydrogens don't have any, you know, they're, they're, they don't get the electron as much. And so they're going to have a little bit of a positive charge. And so within that water molecule, you've got a positive end and a negative end. That's a polar molecule. And it's an important uh, um, uh, characteristic of water. So why do those electrons spend more time around the oxygen? Oxygen really, really wants electrons. And of course, it doesn't want it. but Basically, you know, remember that, that all atoms sort of want to fill their outer valence shell, and oxygen really wants to fill its outer valence shell. Um, oxygen is what they call very electronegative. It really has a high affinity for electrons. And so by, by glomming onto those electrons and holding them tighter, that's a lower energy state. Um, these are more, you know, specific questions for your physics or your chemistry professor. But it is definitely a fact about oxygen is that it really wants electrons. Um, this will be important when we talk about metabolism because that's why you have to breathe in oxygen. That oxygen that you breathe in really wants electrons. It strips electrons from your food in the process. It release, you, know, you release energy. And, and so that's why oxygen is very important uh, to your metabolism. That's for another lecture. But at any rate, 
that's something you, sh you should know about oxygen is just it really wants electrons consequently those electrons spend more time around the oxygen in this water molecule and so here's figure 2.4 from your book kind of showing you the same thing and you see what they're showing you they're showing you those electrons hugging oxygen tighter and so the oxygen end has a more negative charge and the hydrogen end has a more positive charge and so what that causes then is that different water molecules are attracted to each other and so you've got the positive end of one water molecule is attracted to the negative end of another water molecule and so you see first how like understanding the structure of an of a molecule and its properties you, you start to understand other phenomena that you that you you know you, you can explain other phenomena and so you have things like surface tension and capillary action so here you got a picture of a water strider right and so it's like standing on the surface of the water how's it able to do that well those water molecules are attracted to each other and they sort of stick to each other and so if you spread out your your weight and you don't weigh very much it's just like you know standing on a um, on a, any kind of a surface but the reason that those water molecules are attracted to each other is because they're all polar and so the negative end of one is attracted to the, the positive end of another and remember that that positive end are where the hydrogens are and the, the negative end is where the oxygen is but when we see this in chemistry when the hydrogens which tend to be more positive are attracted to a negative part of a different molecule that's called a hydrogen bond and so that's another kind of bond in chemistry we talked about a covalent bond the covalent bond is the strongest kind of bond the hydrogen bond is the weakest kind of bond and it occurs between you know the covalent bond is within a molecule it holds a molecule together the hydrogen bond is usually between molecules and it's because you have this separation of charge within the molecule and so here's a figure from your book again kind of showing hydrogen bonding just between two water molecules or a bunch of water molecules and like I said the hydrogen bonds are the weakest kind of bond and they're very easily broken but if you have a lot of them they become significant so it's like a thread right and so if you have a single thread that's very easily broken but if you wrap that thread around a bunch then it's very hard to rip and tear apart and it's the same thing with hydrogen bonds is that individually they're not very strong and they're easy to pull apart but collectively they can become significant and so then you can see you can get things like surface tension or capillary action within uh, between you know with, with these water molecules and so another uh, property of water that's affected by these hydrogen bonds is the specific heat of water and so let's talk about let's kind of just take a slight digression here let's talk about temperature what is temperature like temperature is one of those things that you use just you know what it is like you know you know what hot is and you know what cold is and you can take your temperature and you know how to measure temperature but physics chemistry we need to talk about well what exactly are you measuring what exactly is temperature temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules or how much the molecules are moving around right and so if something's hotter its molecules are moving around faster and bouncing off each other harder they've got more energy they've got more kinetic energy so kinetic energy is the energy of motion um, you remember when we talked about diffusion that we said that you know all molecules have energy and unless you're at absolute zero they're all moving and they're moving at random but if they have more energy and they're moving faster and bouncing harder that's a higher temperature okay so that's what temperature is and so to get those you know to get the temperature of something up what do you have to do you have to add energy right you put it on the stove you build a fire you, you do whatever and so to make something hotter you have to add energy and then that energy goes into those molecules and causes them to move around faster and so to heat up water no different right if you want to boil a pot of water 
you got to put it on the stove and add heat. You got to put energy into it so those molecules start moving around and then the temperature goes up. But for them to be able to move around, they have to break those hydrogen bonds. So those hydrogen, you know, they're, they're sort of like holding hands with all these water molecules. And so you put more energy in, and that molecule wants to move more, but it can't because it's bound to nearby molecules. And so that you have to put energy in to break those hydrogen bonds, and then the water molecules can move faster and the temperature can go up. And so Consequently, it takes a lot of energy to heat up water because the, the energy doesn't just go into the molecule to make it move faster, it also goes into breaking those hydrogen bonds. Or there's a lot of resistance to movement that has to be overcome, and so it takes more energy. Well, that's the concept of specific heat. How much energy you have to put into something to make its temperature go up. And so something like metal has a very low specific heat. You put a little bit of, of energy into metal and it heats up very much. But you put the same amount of energy into water and water's temperature won't change. And so the analogy I always give is, again, you, you, you take a metal pot, you fill it with water, you put it on the stove. You turn the burner on for 30 seconds. Now, if you lifted up that pot would you, and, and, and touched the bottom of the pan, what would happen? it would burn very badly. That pan is already very hot. It didn't take very long for the temperature of the metal pan to go up because it has a low specific heat. But after 30 seconds, you can still stick your hand in the water in the pot and it wouldn't burn you. It wouldn't feel bad at all because water has a very high specific heat. You have to put a lot of energy into water to make its temperature go up. And the reason one of the and the reason is is because it's got these hydrogen bonds that must be broken. And so that's what I'm saying here. And so when you start adding energy, you're breaking those hydrogen bonds, but the molecules aren't moving any faster. If the molecules aren't moving any faster, the temperature doesn't go up. It's only after you break those bonds, those bonds, that you can finally break all those hydrogen bonds and then make the temperature go up. And then it works in the other way too. And so if you have very hot water and you want it to cool down, it has to lose a tremendous amount of energy. So boiling water has tons and tons of energy and it must lose that energy um, before its temperature can actually drop. So it works in, in both directions. And so the, again, this is a specific, you know, high specific heat is a, is a common property of water. And again, it explains a lot of things. That's something that you already knew, you know, it's why we, we uh, you know, cook things in water a lot and and it's why along the coasts the temperature is a lot more moderate you know because the the oceans can hold heat it takes a lot of heat for them to warm up and then it takes you know and then they they hold that heat and let it out slowly and so temperatures don't swing as much near the coast a lot of things like that are due to the high specific heat of water and so here we're looking at um uh, some water molecules again and so at higher temperatures those molecules are moving a lot, they've got lots of energy, and there's lots of space between them, right? But as this water loses heat and loses energy, the molecules don't move as much, and they start to move slower, and they don't bounce off each other as hard. And so they start to pack tighter. Now there's less space, excuse me, between water molecules. And so at high temperatures, there's lots of space between the molecules. At low temperatures, they pack more tightly. Now this is not unique to water. This is, everything does this, right? Everything uh, has a, a higher density when it's cooler. Most molecules do this at least, but I think all of them do. But here's another unique property of water. At very cold temperatures, the water molecules start to get space between them again. So at high temperatures, they got a lot of space between them. As they cool down, they pack tighter and tighter. But as they get even cooler, they start to get space in between them again. And the reason is, again, these hydrogen bonds cause the water molecules to form what's known as a solid lattice or a crystal lattice. And so the water molecules start to bind to one another uh, at a certain... At a, at a, constant distance. 
and it starts to form this crystalline structure that has actually more space between the water molecules than, than what they did. Well, this is an incredibly important property of water because that's why ice can float. If the water molecules have more space between them, that means that they're less dense. So ice is less dense than cold water. And so that's why ice can float, because it's less dense. This is, if, this, if water didn't do this, you don't exist, right? Because if water doesn't do this, then lakes would freeze from the bottom up. You know, if, if, if ice was more dense than cold water, then ice would form at the bottom, and so lakes would freeze solid. And, and since life evolved in water, you know, if, if these tidal pools where life evolved froze every year, well, then nothing could ever have evolved in there. So it's an, it's an underappreciated and very important property of water. There are other molecules that can do this, but not many. And this is very unique to water. And so we know that water freezes at zero Celsius and it boils at 100 Celsius. Its maximum density is at four Celsius. So at four Celsius, those water molecules are packed as tightly as they can. But if it gets even colder, then they start to form that crystal lattice. And when it gets cold enough, that crystal lattice becomes ice, and then that cold ice is able to float because there's more space between the molecules. And so that crystal lattice, you know, once it starts to form, those hydrogen bonds and things can, can really have a little force there. And so that's where you get things like frost heaving and exploding cans and whatever, is that's because that crystal lattice doesn't allow the molecules to pack as tightly. And so those molecules are trying to spread out to form this lattice and you can generate a tremendous amount of force. One water molecule couldn't do it, but a gazillion of them can do it. And you can burst cans, but you can have things like, you know, frost heave and, and, and push up the foundations of houses and, and break up roads and all kinds of, of good stuff. So it's not an insignificant force um, when you get a lot of water molecules working. Okay. Another property of water, that's what's known as the universal solvent. And so it dissolves a lot of things. And so water's polar, we know that. Lots of other molecules are polar. And so those polar molecules, you know, water's got a positive and a negative end, and other molecules that are polar have a positive and negative end. And so the positive end of one interacts with the negative end of the other, and they interact, they play together very well. And so that, and that's how things dissolve in water. Water can dissolve lots of things if they're polar. And there's a saying in chemistry, like dissolves like. And so polar solvents dissolve polar mo molecules well, and nonpolar molecules, nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar molecules well. So what doesn't dissolve well in water? Like what kinds of things do not mix well with water? Well, think like oil, right? Oil and water don't mix. Oil is not a polar molecule. And so it does not interact with those water molecules well, and so that's one reason why they don't mix well. And so here's figure 2.6 from your book, and it's showing water dissolving um, salt, simple table salt, NaCl, and kind of showing you how these, this polar water interacts with these other atoms to dissolve them. You know salt dissolves well in water, right? Well, salt actually breaks up into two ions whenever it's, it's put into water. And, and not all molecules do this, but salt does this. And so you've got the, the positive sodium and the negative chlorine. And since, you know, the sodium has a positive charge, you can see that the negative end of all these water molecules are attracted and surround that positive sodium. And then if you look at the chlorine molecule, or the chlorine atom, which has a negative charge, you can see the positive end of the water is interacting with that. But again, you can see because they both have separated charges, they can interact in such a way, and you can see how that water surrounds each of those atoms. And that's what it means to dissolve something. And so that's called a hydration shell. So when something dissolves in water, the water molecules all wrap around it and they can do that because of this polar nature of water 
And so that's how that's what it means to dissolve in water is that the molecules get surrounded by a hydration shell. But again, if you have something that's nonpolar like oil, you can't get this hydration shell because the polar water doesn't have anything to react with or to interact with with the nonpolar oil. And so here's another figure showing you the kind of the same thing. You can see the hydration shells. Again, pay attention to how the water molecules are oriented for each of the ions. You know, the, the water's turned one way for the, the chloride, for the chlorine, and it's turned the other way for the sodium. And that those polar water molecules are surrounding the charged particles, and that's how you dissolve things. And so this then helps, we can, we can link back to an earlier property of water. And so because those water molecules are forming a hydration shell with the salt atoms, you know, they're bound to those salt atoms, then those water molecules can't form the crystal lattice. And so if it's getting colder, those water molecules want to find each other and they want to link up and they want to build this crystal lattice but lots of these water molecules are still tied up by salt and they can't form the lattice so the lattice doesn't form well well this is why salt lowers the freezing temperature and so if, if the roads are slick you put salt on them if the sidewalk is slick in the winter you put salt on it and then the ice melts well why does that work well this is why that works because the salt interacts with the water molecules so they can't interact with each other and if they can't interact with each other they can't form that crystal lattice and they can't form ice unless it gets a lot colder so you see how just kind of you know a little bit about water and it starts to unlock a lot of cool things okay here's another thing we're going to talk about the dissociation of water water breaking up so pretend you've got a beaker of pure water just distilled pure h2o nothing else in it when that water is just sitting there some of the molecules will spontaneously come apart. And this again, this is just a property of water. This is just, water just does that. And so what I mean, they break apart. They break apart. Like so you've got H2O and it breaks into a, a hydrogen ion, which is at H plus, and a hydroxyl ion, which is at OH minus right you see if you take the h plus and the oh minus and you stick them together you get h2o but if you take an h2o and you rip it apart you get a hydrogen ion and a hydroxyl ion and like we said some of the water molecules in that beaker will just spontaneously do this you don't have to add energy you don't have to do anything it's just something that water does and and um Remember that a hydrogen ion is just a single proton. Remember, a hydrogen is a proton with one electron. That's what a hydrogen atom is. And if you take that electron away, then you're left with just a single proton. And so when I say hydrogen ion, that's the same thing as just saying a naked proton. And of course, protons have a positive charge. And so a single proton with no electron must have a positive charge. And that's what we're showing you here. We're showing you the hydroxyl ion has a positive charge. Uh, the hot, excuse, uh, I said that wrong. I said that wrong. Everybody pay attention. I said that wrong. The hydrogen ion has a positive charge. The hydroxyl ion has a negative charge. All right? And kind of going back to that, that term that we threw out earlier, an ion is a charged particle. And so a hydrogen ion has a positive charge, and a hydroxyl ion has a negative charge. Anything with a charge on it is called an ion. And so here again, here's a typical hydrogen atom. One proton, one electron, and it's neutral. It has no charge. And it's the simplest atom you can get. Here's a hydrogen ion. One proton, no electron. And so protons have a charge of one. There's no electron to cancel that charge out. So this hydrogen ion has a charge of plus one. And so another way to think about it, where'd that electron go? Well, the hydroxyl got it. So when they split up, the hydroxyl ion got custody of the electron. And so we didn't lose any electrons. It's just the electron went with that hydroxyl ion and so then the hydrogen ion is, is left with that one. And so the, the hydroxyl ion has an extra electron, so it has a negative charge. 
Now, the interesting thing is we know how many molecules of water will do this. It's 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter of water will spontaneously break up like this. And now, again, all chemistry is dynamic. And so, uh, you know, a particular water molecule might break apart and then those ions will float around for a little bit and then they'll bump into one another or different ones and they'll come back together. And so you've got, you know, the, the, the break apart, come together, break apart, come together. But on average, we know the exact concentration of water molecules that will do this. And that's pretty cool. And this is the number, 1 times 10 to the negative 7 molarity. And so that is just another property of water. A certain concentration of pure water will spontaneously break apart. And what is that concentration? 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter. Okay, so let's remember back to our chemistry. If you've ever had it, if you haven't had chemistry, what does this mean? Moles per liter? Again, a little another digression, but it'll be useful for us later on. What's a mole? Uh, think of a mole It's just a name for a common number, like dozen or gross, okay? A mole is just a, a typical value. And so, you know, a dozen is 12, right? A gross is 144, so you've got a name for a typical value. The typical value for mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Now, that doesn't sound like a very typical number, but it's actually, you know, Avogadro's number. It's an important number in chemistry. And it's a way to count molecules or atoms. So, of course, molecules and atoms are very small, right? And, uh, and so counting them can be problematic. Um, but because of the properties of, of, of these atoms, you can say that, that uh, uh, a way to count them is to use this Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which, of course, is a very big number, right? It's 6 with, uh, like, 23... Des, you know, or, or six with like 23 zeros behind it, basically. Um, so it's a huge number, right? And so instead of trying to write that huge number, you just call it a mole and you're good. And so you, you might remember that from your chemistry class if you had chemistry. And so then molarity, big capital M, is a way to measure concentration. And so it's equal to moles per liter. So a mole is just a number. Like if you could count atoms, it would just be a number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. But then if you put those in a liter, if you put one, or if you, if you put, uh, counted them and put them in like a liter of water, then you would have a concentration. You would have a number per volume. And that's what molarity is, okay? And so when we, we say that, that um, the concentration of hydrogen ions in water will be 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter. And so that we know how many hydrogen ions there are in each liter of pure water. Okay? And so, again, 1 times 10 to the negative 7, if you write that out, that's you take the 1 and you move the decimal place to the left 7 times. So that's 0 0.00000001. It's zero, it's six zeros, and then a one. So do this yourself. Write it down and, and convince yourself that that's 10 times 10 to the negative seven. So it's a very small number. Okay. So again, it doesn't matter how much water we have, we know that the concentration of hydrogen ions is one times 10 to the negative seven. Okay. So what? Why am I making such a big deal about this? Why do I care that water breaks up? Well, this is an incredibly important chemical property of water. Remember that we've talked about hydrogen ions before. And those hydrogen ions are very reactive. You know, it's just a single proton with a positive charge. And so anybody that's look, you know, got a negative charge or anybody's like those, those protons will react with everything. And they're very, very common. It's the simplest, you know, atomic thing you can have, right? It's a single proton. That's it. It doesn't get any simpler than that. Um, and so there's, they're just everywhere. There's, there's a gazillion, million, billion of them, and they're very reactive. Consequently, 
they are very important to lots of chemical reactions because they're everywhere and they're reactive. They're always messing with chemical reactions. So we need a good way to measure how many of these hydrogen ions we have. We need a, a good, easy way to measure the concentration of hydrogen ions because they have a lot to do with chemistry, and that's what pH is. And so you've heard of pH. You're familiar with pH. This is the H in pH is for a hydrogen ion. And you probably, you know, again, you, you've, you, you're familiar with pH, but this is exactly what pH is measuring. And so um, you see that in pure water, you know that you're going to have 1 times 10 to the negative 7 moles per liter of these hydrogen ions. And so the pH of pure water is 7. And where did I get the 7 from? I got the 7 from that 10 to the negative 7 right there. And since this is pure water, it's neither an acid nor a base. It's neutral. And so this is why a pH of 7 is considered neutral. And again, you probably knew that. You probably knew that pH scale runs from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. But why is 7 neutral? Because it's based upon pure water, which is neutral. And we got that 7 based from the, the properties of pure water. Cool. And so here's the actual formula for ca calculating pH. It's the negative base 10 log of the hydrogen ion concentration in moles per liter. OK, so study this. And if you're interested, but you don't, don't, you don't have to memorize this for this class. But this is where we got this from. And, and, and if you take that 1 times 10 to the negative 7 and plug it into this formula, you'll get a pH of 7. So this is the actual formula, but let's not, you know, we're not going to sweat memorizing this too much. But here it is if you want it. Now, acids have more hydrogen ions which gives them a lower pH. And so this is one of those kind of paradoxes, like usually when you have more, then your value on your scale goes up. And pH is the opposite. If you have more hydrogen ions, your pH goes down. And if your pH goes down, you've got an acid. And so say you've had 1 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter of hydrogen ions. And so that would be 0.000001 moles of hydrogen ions in each liter. And so water has 0 0.000001 moles of hydrogen ions per liter. So your acid has more per liter. And again, it's 1 times 10 to the negative 6 as, uh, as the concentration in this example. And so I take that 6 and the pH is equal 6. If you take that 1 times 10 to the negative 6 and plug it into that formula that I just gave you, you would get a pH of 6, right? But it's, it's easy if you've got, you know, these numbers like, you know, 1 times 10 to the negative 6, 1 times 10 to the negative 7. You know you can just take that number off the 10, and that's the pH. And so the pH of this acid is 6. But it's got more hydrogen ions. Bases have fewer hydrogen ions than pure water. And so say you had something that had 1 times 10 to the negative 8 moles per liter of hydrogen ions. So that's 0 0.000001. And so that's less hydrogen ions than water. And so that would be a base. And again, if you look at 1 times 10 to the negative 8, if I just take that number from the exponent on the 10, that's my pH, pH of 8. Or you can take 1 times 10 to the negative 8 and plug it into that formula I just gave you, and you would get pH equals 8, eight either way. The important thing is, Acids have more hydrogen ions and their pH is lower. Bases have fewer hydrogen ions and their pH is higher relative to water, which is neutral at 7. Now, also, you'll notice again from that formula that this is a base 10. It's a logarithmic scale. So each one unit change in pH is actually 10 times change in the concentration of hydrogen ions. And so in this example, our acid had a pH of 6, our base had a pH of 8. So the acid has 100 times more hydrogen ions than the base. So there's a 2 
you know, the pH changed by two units, but each of those is a tenfold change in hydrogen ions. And so the difference between the acid and the base in this example is 10 times 10 is 100 times more hydrogen ions. Let me show you another example. Uh, an acid at pH 4 is 1,000 times more acidic than pure water at pH of 7, right? And so if you start with water, a pH of 6 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 7. A pH of 5 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. A pH of 4 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 5. So to go from 7 to 4, you go 10 times, and then you got 10 times that, and then you got 10 times that, that's 1,000, 10 to the third. And so that's what I mean. And so when you go from a pH of 6 to 7, you say, oh, that's just a one, one pH change, big deal. But that's a tenfold change in hydrogen ions. Um, my pond, for example, pH is an important parameter that we measure in ponds. And, you know, the pH can fluctuate in, in some ponds by, you know, from like 8 to 10 in, in, during the day. And you go, oh, well, that's only two pH units. That's a hundred change, hundredfold change in hydrogen ions. And you remember those hydrogen ions are very chemically reactive. That's a huge deal. And so that's another thing that I'd like for you to know about the pH scale. So why, again, am I making such a big deal about this? The pH tells us how many hydrogen ions are around. Those hydrogen ions are very reactive and very common. And so they have a tremendous influence on other chemical reactions. And so, for example, you've got a very low pH in your stomach, like a pH of 2. And so that's a very reactive environment which helps to break your food apart. That's all, another reason you've got a, high, a low pH in your stomach is that's part of your immune system because you know, you're constantly shoveling stuff from the outside world into your body and that stuff is just covered in bacteria and viruses, right? But the first place it hits is your stomach where it's got this tremendously reactive acidic environment that destroys most of those pathogens. So you probably never thought about your stomach as being part of your immune system, but it is. Anyway, that occurs because you've got a very low pH. But if that low pH is, creeps up into your esophagus, you know, you get heartburn because your esophagus is not prepared, doesn't have the thick mucus layer like your stomach does. And so that's how you get heartburn. If the low pH leaks down into your intestine, and that interferes with things like food uptake. And so the pH is very important to these different processes in your body. And, and you need to, certain you know, different places of your body need to maintain different pHs. If you're a botanist or a farmer, you know, the pH of the soil has a lot to do with things like nutrient uptake in that. So um, that's why pH is important. And so then, this whole thing has not just been about pH, but it's been about water and the properties of water. And so why did we just take this whole lecture to talk about water? Well, it's water. Uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's really important. But why is water important? It's involved in all the chemical reactions that keep you alive. All the chemical reactions that, that go on in your cells and, and go on in the world, they all involve water to some degree for the most part. Certainly biological ones do. And so understanding the chemical properties of water then gives you a little bit deeper understanding of a lot of different things in biology. So <coughs> I just swallowed a bug. How about that? Well, that poor bug is right now getting the acid treatment down in my stomach. <coughs> I think that seems like a good place to stop. I'm out here eating bugs. So anyway, um, that's what I have to say about water. And um, as always, let me know if you got any questions. And that's all I've got. So see ya.